The ground was cursed and the devil was cursed. You need to remind him of that every deliverance service and every time you get the opportunity. Listen to this. What does it mean to be more than a church? How can a Christian have an experience that's greater than religion? Can everyone actually understand what the Bible is saying? Is revival for today? Are we undergoing a reformation? Tell me more about apostolic apologetics. Welcome to the More Than a Church podcast. Hello and welcome back to the More Than a Church podcast. I am your host, Zach Breckenridge. As always, welcome. If you are joining again, thank you for coming back. If you are new, well, welcome to the channel. Welcome to the podcast. And if you haven't already, I want to make sure that I invite you to go ahead right now before we get any further into the content, into the video, like, subscribe, turn on those notifications. That gives you the opportunity to be among the very first to find out when new content is released. Currently, we're on a pretty set schedule. I've been releasing them every Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. But who knows, as God continues to develop this and grow this, I look forward to bringing more content out as well. Whenever you share our content, make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag more than a church. I have really enjoyed seeing how many lives have been impacted by this podcast already. Um, it is very humbling, and it also was, if I can say it this way, a little bit sobering for me to begin to see as the comments have been to come begun to come in all the questions that Christians face I, I know some basics and we've already begun to address some of them but um, really learning the community that this is impacting and reaching has been powerful as well as the questions that you guys have had asked of you and so um, I've begun to address and answer some of those questions um, but know that not only am I answering those questions, I love you, my heart is for you and with you, and I'm praying alongside you as well. Today we got a really interesting podcast episode for you in store. I'm very excited about this one. Uh, we are going to answer a question that gets asked, and, and actually I should probably say this question doesn't get asked enough. This question is just presumed that we know the answer. So I'm excited to answer a question that's not being asked as much as it used to. Today we're going to address the topic and answer the question, is man cursed? Is man cursed? Did man inherit this curse from Adam and what is known as the fall of man, the very first sin to enter into humanity. You know, it's pretty common Christianity. It's a common thought amongst Christians that man is under a curse from God. We're going to talk about that. We're going to go back to the very first book of the Bible. I love studying Genesis. That's where we're going to be at for this podcast. But in Catholicism, there was a doctrine that developed in regards to the mother of Jesus, Mary. And there is this thought about Jesus in the Catholic Church, this doctrine that's known as the Immaculate Conception. And they believed that Jesus is without sin. And Catholicism introduced this idea into Christianity that sin and the nature to sin is attached to the sperm of a male. And that man was cursed by humanity. And they even introduced this doctrine that I mentioned of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception said that Mary herself was preserved from sin and that she had never sinned. And that's why Jesus was born God-man and did not sin. Now, in the Protestant church and during the Protestant Reformation, uh, that was one of the issues that the Protestant church has with Catholicism. Uh, it's not true. The Bible says that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That included Mary. But there's more going on to this than just Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. And so there was not a man's sperm to introduce sin and sin nature into Jesus. So I'm excited to go back to 
the garden to go back to Genesis and let's talk about this. Is man under a curse? And I think as we're on here, most of us, as you're joining this podcast, we probably have the notion up front, the presupposition, preconceived notion or idea that man is under a curse from God, that we have inherited this curse from Adam and his wife Eve. But I'm excited to talk through this and share with you some things that we often overlook, especially as we read and we understand. Because Genesis, the creation account, we tend to kind of leave that as a Sunday school type lesson, more for children's ministry, maybe youth or young adult occasionally, but very rarely do we as mature believers go back and study that from the lens and perspective of where we were at in our maturation in Christ. So I'm excited to do that this evening. Uh, I believe we've done a poor job at times reading our Bible and understanding what really took place in the garden. I love the garden because when we talk about the Garden of Eden, we see both God's original design and his intent for both the earth and man. We're able to see what Jesus told us to pray this in his prayer, his model prayer, Matthew 6. He prayed, God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we get to see what God's will being done on the earth looked like prior to sin entering the earth. So I'm excited to talk about that today. We're going to be in the book of Genesis. We're going to go through, I'm not going to read all of it for you. Some of it I'm just going to paraphrase, some of it I'll reference, some of it we'll read in depth, and some I might just pull a verse or two out of a paragraph or a greater passage to fill in the gaps. But we're going to read Genesis, we're going to be in Genesis 1 through 4. We're not going to read all of it, but we'll be in Genesis chapter 1 through 4. By the way, praise the Lord. He's amazing. He told me I was done with my coffee fast. I didn't know it was a fast when I started, but I'm now no longer bound to just tea, and I'm praising the Lord. I'm rejoicing in the Spirit just like Jesus did. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Let's open up with this. I'll pull it up with you, but Genesis is the very first book in the Bible. Not much that I want us to look at just yet, but it is the very first book in the Bible. You can scroll up. There's nothing in front of Genesis chapter 1, except for what man put in there. So the table of contents, copyright, all that stuff, translation information. But Genesis 1 is where the Bible begins. The first five books of the Old Testament are known as the books of the law, the Pentateuch. It's the first five books. And that was the foundation of what we consider the Mosaic Law and where Judaism began, what the Israelites had to adhere to. And it is the not just the foundations of the Old Covenant, but it is our root system as New Covenant believers as well. The book Genesis, the term Genesis, literally means in the beginning. And that's exactly how the book of Genesis opens up. It's a self-titled book. It says Genesis, and then the first three English words in Genesis are in the beginning. In the beginning is the term Genesis. So the genosis, the Genesis, the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes into this details of how God created everything in six days with the epitome, the height of creation being on the sixth day, and on the seventh day, God resting. Now, I want to address two thoughts that have snuck into Genesis chapter 1 before we actually get into the heart of what we're going to talk about today. The very first thing that we have to address is what is known as the gap theory. The gap theory was a doctrine that was introduced throughout church history and basically what the gap theory says is in Genesis 1, God created, and in Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2, it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The gap theory says that God actually created the earth twice. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the earth, and it was perfect, just as we read about later throughout Genesis 1. But when Satan fell, God had to recreate the earth, and this is the story of the recreation of the earth. And there are all these details about Satan and the fall of angels, God casting out all the fallen angels out of heaven, the deliverance that took place in heaven, the archangel Michael and his armies, all of that stuff that is in the Bible and that's biblical, but they have inserted it here in this gap that they say that took place in between Genesis 1, 1 and verse 2. And that is how they explain... Let me kind of pause for a second explain something. The... the the predominant view of Christianity is what is known as a young earth view. There is an old earth view that also is tied to Christianity as well. And that's typically, the gap theory typically holds to the older earth from my understanding as well. And that, that's why they have that gap there. Now, here's the issue that I have with the gap theory. Even if everything in the gap theory, all the stuff that they're tying to that time period, even if all those events were correct, assuming that there is this gap in between verse 1 and verse 2 that the Bible never even seems to insinuate, is a, talk about reading in between the lines, like that is a drastic insertion by humanity to say, you know what, before God even gets started telling his story, we're going to tell you everything that happened that God didn't tell you about. So the gap theory for me is a no, just in short. There's some interesting thoughts that are attached to it, but as a whole, even if some of the later thoughts are good, the, the notion of it, the precept of there being a gap that the Bible left out, it just leads to a trail of error that I'm not willing to go down personally. The second thought is, as we talk about creation, young earth, old earth, there's some resources out there by, what is the ministry called? I should have grabbed one of the book. It's Dr. Ken Ham has a ministry. If you've heard of the Ark Encounter, the Ark Encounter Experience Answers in Genesis. It was found, it was, that was put on by and built by Answers in Genesis Ministries. So it has a lot of great details um, in regards to that. And in the very first um, build by Answers in Genesis Ministry, they built what's called the Creation Museum. And in the Creation Museum, he does a phenomenal job of providing resources to um, express and contrast the young and old earth perspectives, both biblical and extra biblical perspectives on that. So if you want to learn more about that, go visit the Ark in Kentucky and the Creation Museum. I'll plug it. I don't get anything for it. I just enjoyed it. We've been multiple times. All right. But one of the things, because I'll be honest with you and very transparent, as I studied this out in seminary, I was like, okay, I see how the old earth Christianity perspective could be just as plausible as the new earth. I could see where it comes from, and you'll understand why in just a moment. I need to come back and talk about Jewish writing style. Let me just talk about that right now. Because a very common Jewish literature style and writing style we see in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, 1, and 2 are the thesis statement. And then Genesis 1, 3 through chapter 2, verse 3 are kind of like the table of contents. And then whenever you get into the first verses there of Genesis 2, 4 and beyond, kind of where we're going to launch from today, what you really begin to see is the details of the story. That's where the story begins. So there is those who believe in old earth creationism say, well, according to Jewish theology, or Jewish writing literature style, I should say it that way. Moses, who was the author of Genesis, 
either wrote about seven epics of time, or maybe God came to him on seven different days, and God revealed to him on the seven days what was created. And in seminary, I'll be very transparent and honest with you, it seemed like a very plausible theory, and I was like, well, it really doesn't necessarily matter. Neither of those perspectives are going to impact or affect my faith very much in other doctrines. Then whenever I went to Creation Museum, I read something on the wall, and it was like a very short snippet thought, and I was like, wow, that's one of the most powerful statements that I've read in regard to creationism that I've really never heard anybody articulate. And what Dr. Ken Ham was able to express is why Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, 3 why this must be seven literal days of creation. Because anything that has blood or breath in its lungs could not have died prior to sin entering the earth because sin is what leads to death. So everything that old earth creationism or old earth perspective has in its roots and foundations the only way that could even be a plausible option would be if things died prior to sin entering the earth. So there's really no room biblically for that to even be an option. We also understand that And I I say that about anything that has blood or breath in its lungs because prior to the fall of man, actually, before the flood, everything, every living creature was a vegetarian. Dr. Ham has great resources on that if you want to study more of that out. All right. That's not the topic for today, though. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Let's pull it up and let's get into the details of the story. Let's start reading what's going on here. Genesis 1, we'll scroll through it. That's kind of our overview. Let's get into Genesis chapter 2. Why translators put Genesis 2, 1 through 3 in chapter 2 and not in chapter 1, I'm still puzzled to that as of today. If someone knows, please help me out. Beginning with Genesis 2, 4, though, we have the details of the story. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earths and the heavens. And I'm going to skip down a little bit. I'm going to jump down to verse 15 and read the creation of man, the detailed account of man and his wife. We'll talk through that passage a little bit. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man. So he's already been made. I'll jump back, I believe, in just a minute. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It's important to understand that the tree that they were not allowed to eat the one law that God gave them. Eh, Hold on. Let's pull back up for just a minute. It's important to understand that they lived in the garden. And in the garden, God said, as far as you can see, as far as your eyes can behold, every tree, everything that bears fruit, every tree of the garden is yours. But there's this one little scraggly, scrawny tree over here that I don't want you to eat. I think a lot of times people think, as they study out Genesis, that Adam and Eve had two options. They could either eat of the tree of life or the tree of evil. And after a time of eating one tree, they're like, bro, I'm tired of eating that. Let's eat something else. And that's not really what happened, though. They were in this garden, and they had all these options of food that they could eat for their pleasure. And then to give them life, they had this tree of life. And they could eat the tree of life, and they would never die as they're eating this tree of life. And then they had all these other fruit-bearing trees 
that they could eat of that brought them pleasure as they ate them. But there was only one tree that they were not that they were commanded not to eat of. And that tree was the tree of not even of good and evil, it was the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's go back, pull that up. It says, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, verse 16, and then verse 17 says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall surely die. All right, let's keep going on. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, the man, there was not a helper fit for him. Let me say that another way. It wasn't that he was trying on shoes in a shoe store, but there was not a creature that Adam could fit in. There was not a helper fit for him. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took, no, some of y'all are starting to catch that, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is that last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right, there's a lot that's going on there. As we read this, it's important to understand that God made Adam, and he said, okay, there's some issues going on here with man. Man doesn't have a helper that's fit for him. As God looked at everything else that he created, everything that he created was able and willing to both recreate and procreate, except for Adam. Adam was ineligible for this. He said, there's not a helper that's fit for Adam to recreate, to procreate with. And he says, okay, I'm going to do this different than I have any other time. As you read that verse, it says that God performed the very first surgery. So if you've ever wondered, yes, even in the healing movement where we can still be open and pro- to surgical procedures because God was the very first surgeon. He, and by the way, totally good with being put to sleep for an operation too because God put Adam in a deep sleep, a deep slumber. He placed Adam inside and it said that he removed his rib. He took his rib out. Let me pull it back up. It said, verse 21, that he... While Adam slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. Here's something that's really interesting that I know most believers overlook or they don't understand the magnitude of what's going on there. When God created Adam, Adam, I want you to understand this, and I want to make sure that I articulate it very carefully. Adam had this relationship with God. And Adam was told by God, Adam's actually responsible for telling his wife not to eat of this tree because Adam was told that. And it's his responsibility to disciple his wife, his spouse, and tell her that. But Adam had this relationship with God that was, in a sense, mandatory, not really that optional. And God looked at Adam and said, not only is it not good that man can't recreate, it's not good that man doesn't have a choice in this. The Bible, especially in the Greek, has this concept that is connected to our term, our understanding of flesh. And the Greek concept of flesh 
is one of now tarnished and inherent sin nature. However, the original flesh, while it did not have a disposition to sin, it gave us the nature to be able to sin. So we see that what happened is God opened up Adam and in the capacity of Adam as he was closing them up, He closed up where the rib was. He closed up this gap in his body with flesh. It's the very first time the term flesh is introduced in Scripture, which is important for us to know because Adam was a whole man, right? He has skin on him, but for the first time, Adam had flesh, which means now Adam has both free will and a nature to be able to sin. That's something that was missing in Adam prior to that. Then as we look at Adam's response as God wakes him up and his wife is there, Adam responds, he says, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Well, Adam didn't have flesh before that. He had skin, but he didn't have flesh. I hope you understand what I'm saying there because theologically those are two vastly different concepts. Adam had, was a man, but he didn't have flesh. And he said, look, God took out rib from me. She is bone of my bone. And he put where my rib was flesh. And not only is she bone of my bone, she is also flesh of my flesh. So both of them have free will in this nature to be able to sin. Now, once sin enters, then flesh becomes this concept that the Greek and the New Testament is much more familiar with, which is a predisposition and inherent nature and disposition towards sin. And then the last thing that Adam says is, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So literally what Adam says in the Hebrew is, wow, man, or wow, another man, wool man, wow, man is the literal understanding of what is being said in the Hebrew. It says, this is another man, but she's different than me. This is a wow man. Wow, another man, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right, let's let's jump back into this now. Because now we got a little bit of an introduction. We're going to read now Genesis chapter 3. 1 through 13. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 13. Let's see if I can get, I got, yeah, I can get it all in there. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, did God actually say, let me just say this here because I didn't make it in my notes. The very first thing that the woman was challenged upon was the word of God. This is why it's so important for us as Christians to know what did God actually say in the word? What does the word actually say? It's really important to understand Adam and his wife had a relationship with God and their relationship with God was disconnected. It was tarnished because They allowed Satan to question what God actually said. This is why apostolic apologetics is a must in the modern church. We have to know what God actually said so that we can close every door to the devil. If you don't know what God actually said, you are just an open door at any time. He doesn't even have to knock on the door because he can always challenge you in the same manner. So we have to know what God actually said. The devil said, what did God actually say? Did he actually say you shall not eat of any of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent. Now, this is interesting because I want you to remember who told the woman what was said. We never have record that God spoke to the woman. So we kind of presume the responsibility was upon Adam to disciple his wife and tell her what God actually said. 
And she responds to the serpent and says, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Let me tell you when religion was birthed on the earth. And that was in this moment. In this moment, either through the idea that Adam gave an extra man-made rule to his wife or that as the woman was presenting this to the serpent, she presented an extra man-made rule to her, to herself and to him. The Bible doesn't clarify on that. What I know is this is the first time that God gave only one law, only one commandment that man had to keep, and man put an extra rule on top of it, an extra tradition. And legalism, the religious spirit, was given an opportunity to dwell on the earth. See, the religious spirit is the same spirit that killed Jesus. It's the same spirit that Satan, the serpent, was operating alongside here in the garden. See, what happens is when God gives us a standard and we begin to impose our own standards that are more strict than the standard of God, what the enemy does is once we break our own standard, guilt, shame, and condemnation come in. And once guilt, shame, and condemnation come in, we think, Man, if I can't even keep up to my own standard, why even try keeping up to God's standard anymore? So Eve, the wife, grabs the fruit, whatever this fruit was, and she's like, oh, I didn't die. Forgetting or not knowing, this is why I believe that it was probably Adam that told her what to believe. Because she's holding the fruit, and she's like, I didn't die. So I can eat it. All right, let's go back into the the Bible. But the servant said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let's just understand, the Bible says that God is good. They already knew what good was, they just didn't understand what not good was. They had no reference for evil. I really want to go off on a teaching on tongues, but I'll, I'll hold that for another time. I should have talked about it on the other podcast if I was going to. So we'll skip that thought for now. No, we won't. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Maybe I'll remember where I'm at in reading. So you have to understand, who taught Adam to talk? God, right? God speaks a heavenly language. So Adam was speaking the heavenly language on the earth. Who taught his wife to talk? Adam and God. So they were all speaking this heavenly language on the earth. And by the way, if you never really thought about it, who taught the serpent to talk? God. He, he was cast out of heaven. He also spoke a type of heavenly language that was probably marred and twisted once it came upon the earth. But Adam's wife had never heard anything else speak besides God and her husband. So it's easy to see how the serpent could have pretty easily deceived her in that moment. The Bible says that the language only changed once you enter into the Tower of Babel moment and event. He says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, didn't kill her, so then what she do? And ate. And then she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Notice what was going on here with Adam. Adam was not off tending the garden and working the garden like God told him to. Adam was standing by listening to this conversation. And instead of stepping in and saying, that's not what God said, or I'm sorry that I told you that was what God said. This is really what God said. Adam watches, she touches it, and he's like, all right, we broke my rule and it didn't have any effect. Let's see what happens if she breaks God's rule. Because Adam's just standing by and he's like, well, worst case scenario, I got more ribs. God can do this again. She eats of it. She doesn't die immediately. The Bible said that in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall die. So Adam's like, bet. She didn't die. I'm now going to eat of it as well. So she gives it to her husband who was there beside her. Like the Hebrew language literally seems to imply Adam's standing over her watching this all take place. Verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. 
And they sewed fig leaves together and hid, made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? I think God knew, but he was calling him out and giving him an opportunity to repent. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Sin drives you out of the presence of God. It drives you out of God's presence. And the one thing that I wish I could impart, the one teaching that I wish that I could get every believer and Christian to grasp is the free gift of salvation is that when you are in sin, you now get to run towards God and not away from him. From him. The devil still is trying the same tactic here on the earth today. He wants us to, once we sin, feel guilt, shame, condemnation, and go away from the presence of God. But because of what Jesus has done, now when sin comes, we should be running back into God's presence as quick and as fast and as strong, swiftly as we can. Did you catch the first murder in the Bible? Everybody thinks that the first murder in the Bible was Cain killing Abel, but that's not really what took place. The very first murder in the Bible was Adam killing his wife. He watched and made sure she didn't die. Then he ate of it too. But then notice what happened when God came and confronted them. When God came and confronted Adam, he said, Adam, do you eat of that tree that I told you not to eat? And what was Adam's response? The man said, verse 12, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. What's Adam doing? He's throwing her right under the bus. Unresolved sin in the heart of man becomes sin in the hands of his son. Cain kills his brother Abel because Adam had already murdered his wife in his heart. I think Jesus talked about that. Did he not? Did Jesus not say, for whoever hates his brother has already committed murder in his heart? Let me pull that up because I know I'm kind of paraphrasing that. Let me see if I can find it. Goodness, where's it at? Is it not translated as murder in the ESV? Let's see. Matthew, there we go, 521. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to fires of hell. Hold on. I want to find there's a way that Jesus says it that's very powerful that I don't want to misquote. I want to see if I can find it. Uh, that's where he most, what I just read is what he most directly talks about. I'm thinking, I was thinking though of Matthew 18, we talks about the eyes. And Jesus says, for not in that passage, but he also says, for out of the heart is where sin comes from. Jesus is addressing, especially when you think about that, where he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, Matthew 18. Your hand cannot cause you to sin. Your heart is what causes you to sin. Jesus said, if a man would look at a woman and lust after her, he's already committed adultery. Let me see if I can find that one quickly. Let 
Yeah, so that's Matthew 5. What Jesus is confronting, and I've mentioned a couple of different references there, is that sin starts in the heart before it ever moves to the hand. So unresolved sin in the heart of man becomes sin in the hands of his son. Yes, Cain was the first person to physically kill and murder his brother Abel, but Adam murdered his wife in his heart. He'd already decided if she dies eating this fruit, so be it. Then when God confronts him and tries to get him to repent, Adam said, kill her. Life was good, God, when it was just you and me. It was just you and me, and I never sinned. She's the one that made me do it. I know what your word really says. Your word said if we eat of it, we'll die. But she gave it to me. Kill her. Adam, it's important to understand it in Hebrew when you read, it, especially in Genesis, those first couple chapters that we're looking at today. The, the, the Hebrew uses the same term that's translated as both Adam and man. It's the same term. Both that that one word, that one Hebrew term, derives from the term for red, denoting the red clay that God used in Adam's formation. But there is only one word for Adam, man. Those two, those two English words really are interchangeable because they're translated from the same Hebrew concept and term. God formed Adam. God made his wife. Man was formed, the Bible said, and the Hebrew term means that God fashioned him. So I'm not going to go back and read that. I said I'm not back up to it, but this is me at least mentioning it. Man was formed. Man was fashioned. Woman, the Bible said, was made. So man was formed in the English. The Hebrew concept is fashioned. Woman was made in the English. The Hebrew concept for that is built to develop buildings or to rebuild. So God fashioned Adam. And then God redesigned man 2.0, if you will, with woman. The original state, the Bible says, of both man and woman is Genesis. I'm going to pull it up on my phone, so I've got a couple different. When I do the quick verses, I can just read it. Genesis 2.25. This is the original state of man and woman in the garden on the earth without sin. This is what it looks like to be in a marriage covenant outside of sin on the earth. This is how you function as a man, as a woman, independently and collect connectedly flesh, one flesh on the earth. Verse 25 says that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That is the original state of the marriage covenant on the earth, both naked and unashamed, both naked and unashamed, right? Completely and totally uncovered with one another, exposed with one another, vulnerable with one another, and not ashamed of anything or any area or part of their lives. Now, I mentioned this a little bit last week. That was what made me decide to go ahead and do this podcast this week, that the wife was taken from Adam's rib, from his side. And that gives us the prophetic image. She didn't come from his feet because she's not meant to fall behind him when he steps forward, nor is she meant to come beneath him. She was not made from a part of his head because she's not meant to go before him or rule over him. The original state of naked and unashamed, the one flesh covenant of a man and his wife, is that they're meant to do life side by side to make decision together. So they, when a problem or issue arises, they should come together in counsel and find unity and move forward together. But then sin comes in and messes everything up. Sin comes in through, as I said, deception and rebellion. The wife says, I was deceived. Adam is in rebellion against God. Now, let's get to the main purpose, because the main purpose of this podcast is to look at what most call the curse of man. When man got cursed, the fall of man, when man got it from the big man himself. That's going to be, I'm going to jump down a little bit now. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through... Well, I'm going to stop a couple different times. I'm going to read 13 through 15, but we'll read down through, I think it's like verse 20, 19, somewhere in there. 
All right, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So they've eaten of it now. God's confronted them. And now it's time for God to, to hand out some spankings. It's time for some whoopings. It's time for God to curse everybody, right? Genesis 3, verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All right, I'm going to leave this pulled up for just a moment as I'm sharing on this versus just going back to the talking head. Because I want us to look at a couple different points on this. So this is, if you'll reference, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, this ancient dragon, this dragon, that ancient serpent. So we understand the Bible's talking about Satan, right? And you can study that out. Look at those cross-references. But God is addressing the serpent that deceived them, Satan himself. And what's going on here is God speaks to the serpent first and addresses the serpent before he addresses the woman and then the man. Because the issue started with the serpent, then went to the woman, and then the man. So that was the order that God dealt with them. This is the first time we see church discipline, right? And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. So in this moment, Satan is defeated. God takes the feet off the serpent, and we have snakes now that wander around. And they literally, God made man out of the dust, and God is shoving in the enemy's face every moment of every day until the return of Jesus. All God needs to make something better than him. He's literally shoving the residue of, of man back in the face of Satan every day. And then listen to this. It says, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, I need you to stop and understand something about this right here. This verse right here. I'm going to pull back, myself back up. The Bible says, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is why the devil hates women in ministry. This is why women are more sensitive to spiritual warfare. Because the enmity was not between the serpent, Satan, and all devils and man. The enmity is between ser serpent, the serpent, Satan, and women. He said the enmity is going to be between you and the woman and her offspring. Now, eventually we understand this is a prophetic declaration that Jesus will come and Jesus shall bruise Satan's head and Satan will bruise the heel of Jesus. But the Bible says this is something that we have to understand, prophetic insight. The battle, Satan hates women. He does. He absolutely hates women being in ministry, being in the presence of God, being and leaning in the church. Because the enmity is between women and the serpent. So that's why a woman is sensitized. She is sensitive to spiritual happenings. Because the enemy really is at enmity with her. Satan despises women, and especially women in ministry. So next we see that God speaks to the woman. Verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. So this is where the concept, where we're introduced to submission and the concept of submission. But really this was to protect the woman. Because God's saying, listen, I love you. I made you. I don't want to kill you. Your husband obviously doesn't care if you're here with him or not, but it's better for you to be here with him. So what's going to happen next time is the next time that you two are in contingency over a matter, you're going to submit to him and I will honor your honoring and obedience to my word. And so when man's found to be in sin again, it won't be as bad and I will show mercy and grace again on the household. Because really, even through 
her deception, she was really submitted to the desires and intentions of what Adam was trying to do. So now, as the the married couple are supposed to walk in together in unity, when there's contention, she says, all right, your husband shall rule over you. You shall submit to him. But really what God's saying is, you're going to be obedient. You're going to kind of cover this situation so I can see at least one of you are listening so that if he's right, great, because he's the one that I've told my word to and he's the one that's responsible for it and for discipling you. But if he's wrong, I'm going to see that you're at least in obedience and I will show mercy and grace again. Then God turns pretty quickly. So we see that there's pain and childbearing and pain you shall bring forth children. Then God speaks to Adam, verse 17 through 19. Woman only got one verse, right? One little par paragraph. Adam got three. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants, eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. As we look through this, we see... Work was always God's original intent with Adam. I think it was one of the very first verses we read, maybe the one we opened with. God put Adam in the garden to work it. Work was always the original intent of man on the earth. But now there is pain, labor that's associated with it. He said, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. It says, you're going to sow and reap, and you're, there's going to be thorns and thistles that come up. And you're going to eat the plants of the field, but it's going to be about the sweat of your face that you're able to turn that into something that's now pleasurable for you, bread. And he says, one day you, you will die. I am God. I don't go against my word. So even though I'm showing you mercy and grace, you're going to die from dust you were taken, and to dust you shall return. Now, as I read that, I only read the word cursed twice. Genesis 3.14, the serpent is cursed. Genesis 3.17, the ground is cursed. Listen, menstrual periods and birthing pains are not the curse on the woman. Man having to labor is not the curse upon the man. Man and woman were not cursed by God. Man and woman became cursed later on, but it was by man, not by God. But God never cursed humanity. God never cursed humanity a single time there. Not at the beginning. This develops throughout human history, but God never cursed humanity right here. God only disciplined his children. The ground was cursed, and the devil is cursed. And listen, you need to remind him of that every deliverance service and every time you get the opportunity. Listen to this. Listen to Genesis 4.11. Let me... Actually, I'll tell you what. Let me pull it up on my phone. Genesis 4, 11. So I can keep where we're at there. But listen to Genesis 4, verse 11. It says, And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So very quickly, the very next generation, the eldest son, Cain, becomes cursed. Cain inherits the curse of the ground. But Adam and his wife were not cursed. Cain wasn't cursed. Abel wasn't cursed. Seth was not cursed. Cain becomes cursed because he kills his brother and the blood of Abel hits the ground. And so Cain inherits the curse of the ground. Now, then what happens? The descendants of Cain Become cursed because Cain killed the prophet Abel. Jesus calls Abel a prophet. You can go back and study that out and find that reference. And we can also become cursed, right? We can become cursed. There's other times that God talks about curses throughout the Old Testament. Hopefully this piques your interest and you will go and study it out. But let me tell you the most common way that believers, that really all humanity, enters into being cursed is the same way that led Cain into being cursed. If you go back and you study that out, 
Cain was cursed because he waited some time before he brought an offering to God, but Abel brought the choicest, best, and first first fruits, the tithe to God. And then Cain really just brought God some of his leftovers. It was about tithes and offerings. Listen to how we, it's the most common way that we become cursed, that humanity becomes cursed. It has to do with the exact same thing that caused Cain to become cursed. Gen, or excuse me, Malachi 3 chapter, Jesus help me, Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. Yeah, let me start there. It says, will man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? God responds, in your tithes and contributions or offerings. God says this, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test as the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. I think most Christians fail to understand that tithes and offerings are what will determine whether the world looks at us and calls us either cursed or blessed. It goes down to our tithes and offerings. We understand that your tithe, the way I like to say it best, is your insurance policy. You're buying and taking out an insurance policy with God. Because with your tithe, giving your God the first 10% of all the increase that comes into your household, God says that when you bring the full tithe into the storehouse, there will be food in his house. That's how God provides for those who serve his kingdom inside the temple, inside the house of God, the local storehouse, right? You probably heard this preached a lot. And he says, put me to the test. If I want to open the windows of heaven, pour out for you blessing until there's no more need. And then I will rebuke the devourer. So when God, when you bring your tithe to God, God opens up the windows of heaven so blessings can begin to be released upon you. And God does spiritual warfare on your behalf. God will rebuke the devil. Listen, my favorite way to conduct a deliverance service is to slap the devil in the face with a $100 bill. My favorite thing to do is every time I get paid, going in and texting my tithe to God before anything else comes out. Because I just want to slap the devil in the face and say, you can come back in two weeks, but guess what? I'm going to tithe again and God will rebuke rebuke you, Satan, on my behalf. Did the angel not say the Lord rebuke you? Come on, y'all need to top that in the comments. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. And But then notice what it said in verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Our offerings, our contributions, what it is that goes above and beyond outside the tithe. The tithe is the bare minimum, the mandate of what Christians give to God. The offerings are often called, depend on your contextual understanding, most of the time we call those seeds. You got to sow seed into good soil. Jesus told a parable about that. Go study that out on your own time. But the tithe ensures that the seed that is sown that will grow and produce a harvest. Jesus said some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. But hear me out. You will never enter into the place of blessing if you're not sowing both if you're not giving both tithe and sowing seed offering or contributions because Jesus can't multiply the tithe. The tithe is what ensures that the seed will turn into a harvest, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. But when you tithe and produce an offering, the blessings of heaven are raining down to multiply the offering. And God has already rebuked the devourer and he shall not eat the fruit of the seed that was sown in the contributions, and all the nations shall call you blessed. Who, my God, I feel like I should just stop and take up an offering right now. I won't, though. Not yet. The main way that we become cursed as Christian saved believers is by and through robbing God. We didn't just rob him by not giving him the tithe. He said, you're robbing me because you don't give me the tithes and the offerings. Some people calling the offerings a tithe. It ain't. If it ain't 10%, you ain't even hit the bare minimum but 10% is your insurance policy on everything else that goes beyond that. Man's not cursed. Man is not cursed. The way that we become cursed, or should I say the typical way that we become subjected to curses, 
is actually not even through this, it's through word curses, which is humans, often by demonic influence, speaking curses over one another. So it's humans cursing themselves, others of us, right? Another man. God did not curse you. God does not curse you. Let me say it again. God did not curse you. God does not curse you. Stop agreeing with the lie that you are cursed simply because you were born. <laughs> Got to rejoice in the spirit. God did not curse you. God does not curse you. Stop agreeing with the lie that you were cursed simply because you were born. And you've got to also break off those word curses that were spoken over you. We witnessed this later on by Noah in relationship to Ham and Canaan, typically referred to the Hamitic curse. I'm going to do a future podcast on that probably in about three weeks. I've got a couple more topics I'm going to touch on before that. But that's a big one that we got to answer and address too. But we also witnessed man cursing man, humanity, another human being, in Adam and his wife. You didn't know this, but you've been calling Adam's wife by the wrong name and cursing the mother of humanity your entire life, your whole life. You probably didn't know it, but you have been. Let's get into the Bible. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 20. So we're down here to verse 20 now. We're going to go into just the beginning of verse 4, but we're getting pretty close through at least the scripture. We got some more stuff to talk about, but meaning with verse 20 says, then the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That's so pleasant sounding, isn't it? Let's look at this little footnote here. What's that superscript essay? Eve sounds like the Hebrew term for life giver and resembles the word for living. Wow, that's just so pleasant. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, us, Lord God, us, who is us. This is language denoting the Trinity, more than one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and knowing good and evil. And now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the tree of life. All right, we'll get to four in just a few moments. The first thing that we that I want to observe, it wasn't the first thing that we read, but the first thing that I want to observe is that God clothed Adam and Eve with garments of skins. Now, the one thing that I know and understand, and I grew up in the South, so I grew up in my teenage years hunting, fishing, right? All the things that the stereotypical Southern white man does. Not all those things. Lord Jesus, thank you for protecting me from all that stuff. But hunting and fishing, I can at least say that. All right. I grew up in those Southern ways. One thing that I know about skins is they don't grow on trees. Now, the Bible never tells us what animals God sacrificed. And I believe that it was because of this. It was because in that moment, a pair of Created animals by God died on behalf of Adam and Eve. And we don't know what they are because they no longer exist. So God made all these animals in pairs so that they could recreate, they could procreate. But something gave up its life that ceases to exist. It was the first animal to go extinct on the earth so that Adam and Eve didn't have to die in that moment. The, this pair of animals became living, a became, let me say this, a temporary substitutionary atonement for the skins of Adam, for the skins, for the sins, excuse me. This pair of animals became a temporary substitutionary atonement for the sins of Adam and his wife. It's why you see, listen, let me, let's, little side note. This is why oftentimes when you had an old school Bible, the most expensive Bibles were leather bound. Because every time that you picked up your Bible to go to church, you were supposed to be reminded that God killed an animal so that humanity wasn't wiped out on at the very beginning. That we still live on this earth today because of an act of God. 
a temporary substitutionary atonement where God took the lives of an entire an entire lineage, an entire genus, species of animals and just wiped them off the planet on behalf of Adam and Eve. This was an act of mercy and grace by God. The Bible says Romans 6, 23, let me pull it up, but basically what it's going to say is the wages of sin is death. What you earn on this earth, your wage is death. You cannot, no matter what good works you do, work your way into salvation. Your What you earn for how hard you worked on the earth is death. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, in this day, we understand theologically, Adam and his wife, their spirit died. They were separated from God at that moment eternally, unless there was restitution of their relationship. But physically, they received mercy. And they also received grace, a gift they did not deserve. So mercy's not getting what you do deserve. They didn't die instantly. But then God goes so far to give them grace, giving them a gift that they did not deserve through the sacrifice so that their relationship had a hope of restoration. So they and all future descendants, now all of humanity, doesn't die instantly and have no hope of a life with God again once sin enters into our lives. We have to understand the default position of humanity is that God desires to do life with you. God desires to do life with you. Even when you sin, God desires to do life with you. And God has done a lot to make sure that he can still do life with us. Listen, though, to how Adam's language changed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Genesis 3.20 says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Did you notice that all this time before, we've been calling this woman wife, and then all of a sudden, Adam gives his wife, and Adam's the one that named all the animals, Adam gives his wife a new name. Let's study this out. Let me pull up Logos. I think I forgot last week, but I'm going to try to remember to um, throw the link in the comments for those of you who want to use Logos to discount for 10% off and five free books. 10% off the packages, I should say. There's lots of other great discounts and stuff through that link as well. But Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Let me pull it up now. Show you guys what I'm talking about. This is God speaking. God calls her woman here. God's speaking to her. He's disciplining her, but what does God call her? God calls her woman. Now, when you hover over, it says Eve, woman, wife of Adam, mother of human race. Let's highlight it, though, because the actual language is going to tell us something. All right, this is a Hebrew term, Esau. Esau. We'll get to it in just a moment. Right? I'm going to pull it up, but I want to show you when God talks to her, God uses this term Esau. To Esau, God calls her woman. That's the same, verse 16, to the woman, to Esau, God said. When God speaks to her, he refers to her as woman. Now, Genesis 3.20, it says, the man called his wives, you hover it over, God help us for these quick references. It's the same Hebrew term. So I wanted you to see that. This is Esau. Now we're going to study out what is Esau. Who is Esau? Well, when you look at this, now there's a lot of other crazy ways that this gets twisted and marred later on. But the term Esau in Hebrew is woman, wife, female, and queen. After man gets disciplined, see, to Adam he said, after man gets disciplined, the very... Next thing that man does in response to his discipline to God is man turns back to his wife and calls her a new name. He calls her Eve. But his wife, this woman, Esau, is woman, wife, female, queen, the originally designed woman by God. And he begins to call the original woman, his wife, by a new name, Eve. Let's look up Eve. You see 
The Hebrew language changes here. This is the first time in the Bible that we're introduced to this term because before this, she was always the woman. She was always the wife. But now the wife has a different name. That name is Hava. Let me pull this up for you. Kava, Hava, Eva. I'm not great on Hebrew. I don't have enough phlegm, so you'll have to just give me some grace on it. I'm working to develop enough phlegm to speak Hebrew as easily as we can speak Greek and English, but it just ain't always there. I ain't got enough phlegm. Praise the Lord. So kaval is a new term. I want us, I'm going to hover over some of these resources. Some of them we're going to dive into, but I want us to see other terms that are associated with or that later derive from Eve from kaval. If you'll see first, one of the very first terms that's derived there from this is the term thorn or thorn bush. You see, that's one of the first things that's derived from there, from this resource. And by the way, I'm not going to open all of them, but there's abbreviations. So the book's not called Shalot. It's that one is, please tell me, no content title page, a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. So I'm not going to go through through what all those are, but all of those are, these are just abbreviations for what the text or the book actually is. All right. So from this very first resource, we see that thorns and brambles, thorn bushes, brambles come from, or later derived from the same term, from kival. Now let's look at what the New American Standard Bible Dictionary has to say. Later on, we see, uh, let's see. It says the very first thing that this is an unused word for life. I'm going to look down towards the bo bottom there, 2336, that reference from Strong's Gordons. It says briar, bramble, hook, ring, fetter. It actually, the ring and the nose comes from this. Uh, thread comes from this, is derived from this. Um, also, where is it at? I looked over it. Uh, 2333 three, three and 34. It says a tent village, towns, and then a specific tent village there. All right, so tent settlements or villages and an unused word for life. Hold on with me. We're going through these, but we're going to talk about this. I'm going to put piece all these derivatives together in just a moment to share what was really going on when Adam changed his wife's name, start calling her by a new name. If you look down there close to the bottom, you see in bold the term declaration. So to make a kava is to make a declaration. Um, I'm actually going to open up this resource quickly. This is the abridged BDB. I forgot what it stands for. Brown's Driver Briggs Hebrew Lexicon, Hebrew English Lexicon. This is the abridged version. I'm going to go back to the full version in just a minute. Um, you scroll down, one of the concepts that derive from this, after the ones that we've already looked at, the one that they really have to add to it is world dance writhe. To dance, to twist, writhe in pain, especially in childbirth to be in severe pain or anguish. Um, and then I'm not sure if it was in this one. It was one that I was reading earlier on. It literally means to live in anxiety or to be in a state of anxiety, to suffer torture. All right, writhing in pain. Let me hover over this next one. This last one down here at the bottom. And from this one, we see the term seer. Um, so she's a seer as well. So Eve was actually, Kava is a seer. I'm going to put all this together. Let's look at this last one. I'm going to open up the Briggs driver or what? Well, maybe we'll hover again. Brown driver Briggs. I'm going to open that up. The full definition. There's something else that I want to show you up here at the top right here. It says, after this, who suggests serpent as a possessive meaning. Serpent as the possessive meaning. So if you're familiar with the 
English language, whenever we add an apostrophe S, it means that whatever we're talking about is owning that. Well, this term, kaval, is the object that has been possessed, and it suggests that the serpent is who has ownership rights of kaval. This is what Adam is really saying by calling her Kaval, by calling her Eve. Adam is saying, I decree and declare over you, woman, that by your sight, you are the one who brought short life, a life that ends to this earth. You are the woman who will writhe and dance in pain as you bear my children. You are the one who all the bad punishments that God gave to me, you are the one that really calls those two, not just your discipline. You're the one who birthed my discipline. You are the one who has caused us to live in tents, who are now wandering and exposed us to vagabonds. Adam says, Eve, you are possessed by Satan. No longer are you one with me. You are one with the devil. The serpent owns you. Man who was not cursed by God, but discipline turns and Adam cursed his wife and he renamed her Eve. But notice, let's go back to see what God has to say about this. Let me pull back up the actual Bible. So Adam changes in verse 20, his wife's name to Eve. Verse 21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Let's go back. Let me close it out. What did... When God was disciplining her, what did he call her? He called her the woman. He called her Adam's wife. And Adam tries to call his wife by a new name. And God is still calling Kaval this woman. What's he calling her? Esau. Esau. God still recognized her as wife. He still recognized her as original woman. Even though there was sin in her life, God didn't change her identity. Man did. There's implications of that and to that. Here, here's what happened because Adam changes his wife's name. Listen to what happened later in his own family because of this. How his family begins to fall apart because he renames his wife. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now Adam knew his knew Eve, his wife. Let me slow down. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his, son, his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And you can keep going on and reading into that story, but I'm going to kind of give you the overview of it. The Bible says in Genesis 4, 1, that Adam knew Kaval, the possessed one, and the possessed one birthed Cain, the murderer, the one who continued in the sins of the father. And Adam knew Kaval, Esau. Adam then knew Esau, the God-made woman, and the God-made woman, his wife, birthed a prophet by the name of Abel. And as you keep reading that story, you'll see the tradition of man cursing man continued because what happens? Eve names Cain Spearhead, the thought that he was a warrior, that he was the Messiah, because they misunderstood the prophecies that God gave them, that, that, that the woman would be redeemed and restored through the offspring, that her offspring would crush the serpent. They misunderstood the prophecy, that the prophecy was about the Messiah to come, the Christ Jesus himself, and they put the pressure of the messianic fulfillment of that upon Cain. No wonder he couldn't live up to their standard. Not only did they believe that Cain was the Messiah, Adam put the pressure on his son to be his redemption. Because God said, your discipline, Adam, is that you will work the field, and the field you will it will yield to you by thorns and uh, thorns and thistles, briars and brambles. But you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. And Adam said, I'm not taking the responsibility of my discipline. Oh, Eve, you think that this son, Cain, is the warrior, the Messiah, who will, the spearhead, who will crush the serpent's head? Okay, you get to deal with my punishment. You get to deal with my discipline. And so Cain was stuck out in the field bearing the full weight 
of the messianic fulfillment, the sins of both of his parents, and the responsibility and the discipline that his father should have received. And the pressure that Adam put on his son Cain to be his redemption led to Cain murdering Abel. Because Adam put his discipline upon Cain by misinterpreting the prophecies of God. And we know that that was not just God disciplining him, but those were prophecies. We understand that from prophetic literature, that it's indented to recognize that God was prophesying. Esau, his wife, right? This came out of the same womb, but we have the possessed womb and the pure womb that's the same womb. Y'all help me out. Help me out in the comments. And Esau bears Abel. And this time, the woman feels the full brunt of the pain of childbearing. And she names his child, the second born, short breath, vanity. That's what Abel literally is transli transliterated or would be literally defined as, translated as, short breath or vanity. Life is vanity. And his life, as was prophesied by his mother, Abel's life was nothing but a short breath from God. Abel was a prophet, but it was short-lived. Adam knew Kavah Esau once, but birthed two sons. He knew Kavah, and her lineage was Cain. And he knew Esau, and her lineage was Abel. But let me bring some prophetic restoration to us. Because too many men are looking for a Kavah and laying with a Kavah, hoping that she'll become an Esau. But if you want an Esau, then you got to go looking for an Esau and stop searching for the Kavah. Your eyes are, have fooled you and deceived you because your eyes are for the possessed, those possessed by the serpent, but you hope that she'll become and bring the blessings of a wife anyway. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 is what we just read. I want to pull it up in Logos, and I want to do a quick word study on that one as well. Genesis 4, 1. You already read it. But I want to look up here. I don't I don't care about Heva. Heva, I want to know about this Esau. Because my wife, I want her to be the originally designed woman of God, who God desires for her to be, not what man has decreed over her. I'm going to click on wife and wives. And I want us to scroll down. And I'm going to have to scroll for just a minute. So you'll have to just hold on with me. Because that term is used a lot in the Bible. But I want us to understand how the Bible describes the God-designed woman, and who the God-designed woman is. And we're going to come to a passage in just a moment from the liter the wisdom literature that's going to be familiar to a lot of you, especially the women that are listening. Right here, Proverbs 31, verse 10. An excellent Esau, who can find? She's far more precious than jewels. An excellent wife, who can find she's far more precious than jewels. The Bible says this woman, the perfect wife, is Esau. The Proverbs 31 woman is the Esau, the originally created God-ordained wife, woman. The woman living her full, full God-desired intentions. So the Proverbs 31 woman is the woman who understands the original identity of a woman and takes ownership of that. The Proverbs 31 woman is the woman who is not cursed by man. That's who the real wife was designed to be. The Proverbs 31 woman was who Adam's wife was going to be had he not cursed her. Come on, I want to read this to you because in Proverbs 31, beginning with that verse, verse 10, it begins to describe for us who the Esau, the perfect woman, the wife, is supposed to be and was designed by God. It says, an excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and does 
and not harm him. All the days of her life, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchants, and she brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet nigh and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it, and with the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and make with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the dis to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple royalty. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hand and let her works praise her in the gates. The woman, she considers a field and she purchases it. She goes out and she's got products that are profitable. Her husband is one of influence and he is known among those who make decisions in the city. And he is one who provides counsel to the decision makers. He's one that is known to the politicians. All because of how well she runs her household. Because she is the originally God designed woman. And she opens up and she is one who is teaching. She is a minister, a preacher, one who who brings and teaches her family and those who come into her household about the ways of God because she understands him. She was empowered by her husband. It is time for us, church, to reverse the curse. To reverse the curse of man that man has brought upon himself that he has put himself in the position of and inherited himself. It is time for us to reverse the curse that has been falsely laid and put upon women, upon our wives, by us as husbands and by men who have come before us. The invitation for today, I want you to pray along with me, intercede along with me. Listen, I feel the Lord really stirring me, the Holy Spirit stirring me for us to break off word curses, break off the curses off of us, break off the curses that we have put ourselves in attached to because of disobedience, failing to bring God what is God's and even more so. Pressures of the Father, curses of the mother. This is the hour for the Esau's to arise. Come on, I want you to pray with me. I want to pray in the Spirit first. Pray in the Spirit with me and let's build up our most holy faith. Father, I pray that you would purify the mouths of the men, that you would purify our mouths, that you would allow our tongues to be fully surrendered over you. How great a mighty rudder it is that changes the entire course of life, that has been set on fire by the fire of hell. Father, would you teach us as men to bridle our tongues when we speak and make declarations over ourselves, over our children, over our wives that are befitting of your image and identity over them. When we see them as you see them and speak over them what you speak over them. Father, I break in the name of Jesus every word curse that's come out of the mouths of the husband, every word curse that's coming out of, that's come out of the mouths of the wife, out of the mouths of the man, out of the mouth of the woman. Father, would you fully allow us us to step into our identity that you created us to our original intent our original design our original dna i uproot and break every word curse now in the name of jesus every pressure that was placed upon you by the father may that yoke be dismantled and destroyed upon your life the anointing is destroying the yoke now in the name of jesus and the yoke of jesus shall come upon you for his yoke is easy and his burden is light and the yoke of the ways 
ways of the devil, every pressure that's been placed upon you by the Father is completely and totally obliterated and made unrecognizable in your life. Father, I uproot every lie and every curse of the mother that's been spoken against the children of God. I declare that every word that was released over your children that was not in alignment with your identity, with your heart, and your word, God, I break those curses off now in the name of Jesus. Father, I command the Esau to arise in the woman. I speak to your original identity, who you are in Christ Jesus, and I command Esau to arise within you. May you take your place, Proverbs 31 woman. May you take your place in influence. May you take your place in entrepreneurship. May you take your place even in the pulpit. I see prophetic women rising up. I understand and know this is an hour of the Deborahs, but this is an hour for the women to take place in the marketplace as well. I'm reminded of a word that the Lord gave me some time ago for our church, that as the women are taking their rightful place in the marketplace, that the men are going to be humbled and return to their place at the altars. And it is the men seeking God at the altars that will allow the unification of the marriage to be complete. Father, I thank you for complete and total unity within every marriage that's on here. Father, I thank you that there are no kavos, that there are none who are submitted to Satan, but the Esau, the true woman, is submitted to you. Father, as your sons and your daughters, may we receive your discipline. May we be free from the curses, but may we receive your discipline and not turn around and curse another man or woman. Father, I thank you for your purity coming upon your church. I thank you that you are renewing and restoring both the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, who are one flesh in your sight. Because when man curses his wife, he's cursing himself. Father, I pray that he would see that Holy Spirit convict him of that. Father, I thank you that every lie is broken off. I take every thought captive that would attempt to exalt itself above the name of Christ Jesus. We destroy every lofty opinion that was raised up by man in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you that through the Esau's arising, the true God-created man may take his rightful place and influence as well. He may take his place where you desire for him to be, knowing That one who is equal to him and equally him has all the matters of the household well taken care of as his ambassador. Just as we are all your ambassadors, Christ Jesus. Jesus, I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this episode. I'm excited for the next couple of weeks. Why it's important for you to go ahead, like, subscribe, turn on those notifications. If you haven't yet, don't fail to do so. I'd love for you to share in the comments today your number one takeaway. I know this is way different than we've heard probably our entire lives, but I believe that the wife doesn't deserve to be cursed every time we tell our children about her. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for joining me on the More Than a Church podcast. This is how we have an experience that's greater than religion. We understand the word of God, and we don't add anything to it or take anything away from it. Thank you for joining me again. I'll see you guys back next week. Have a very blessed week.